Hey witches, Tiffany here on Bewitching Bemused. Today we're going to talk about the basics of magical protection. Now this is a very broad subject that ranges from everything from day-to-day -day protection and cleansing all the way to protecting yourself and your space during spirit communication or if you have an item or a home that a spirit has latched onto an unwanted spirit i should specify it's everything from protecting yourself from negative energy to curses to again unwanted dark entities there is a lot to cover. So as we move along where I can, I will point you in the direction of one of my videos where I cover certain aspects of this more in depth because I am going to keep this a pretty general introduction. If there's something that I cover that I don't currently have a video on and you would love to hear more specifics and more detail about it, please let me know in the comments below. This is going to be part of a highly requested series of videos covering the basics of witchcraft. Now I have already put out a couple of videos covering topics on the basics, some of the foundational stuff, but I kind of made them willy nilly. And now I'm really trying to focus in because people have been asking for this and I really want to deliver. So over the next few months, you will see more of these witchcraft basics videos coming out. They will all go into the same witchcraft basics playlist. That's the word I'm looking for. So if you want more, make sure to check that playlist out. But before we begin, today's video is brought to you by Dossier. I started this video by lighting a Dossier scented candle and it smells amazing. You guys know I love my scented candles. I start off every video lighting one, but candles are not even their main product. Dossier reproduces high-end luxury perfumes at an affordable price. So before dropping a load of money at the Macy's perfume counter, check out the Dossier website and see if your favorite scent has been recreated within their catalog. If they don't have it, drop them an email and request it. Each bottle and candle comes with a detail card that tells you exactly what notes your scent carries, which perfume it was inspired by, and information on how to return or exchange your perfume if you aren't 100% satisfied. Not only are you already saving a ton of money by shopping with Dossier, but they also have excellent bulk deals, including 25% off and free shipping when you buy three or more bottles. Plus, if you use the special link that I put in the description box down below between now and February 1st, 2022, you'll get 10% off your order. One of the main things that I love about dossier is that their products are vegan and cruelty free. They also make efforts to run a sustainable business by using recycled materials for their packaging and their product bottles, non-toxic and environmentally friendly ingredients, and none of their return products are thrown away. They are donated to the charity Give Back Box. Dossier also has excellent customer service, including a 30 day return policy, plus free returns and exchanges. I know it can seem really risky buying perfumes and candles over the internet because you can't really tell what they smell like, but that's one of the things that so amazing about Dossier. You can make the purchase without making the commitment. So after this video, make sure to click that link down below in the description box to head over to Dossier and check out their product lines. I promise you will not be disappointed. Back to the video. So when I say protection, I'm sort of using that as a catch-all term because as I said, this is a very general, very broad introductory video and a very broad, very general topic. If you really want to break it down, there is cleansing, banishing, and warding or shielding. I don't really use those terms interchangeably, although sometimes there is some crossover. And I just want to clarify that now so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about when I use each word. So to use a mundane analogy. Let's imagine a teenager's bedroom because those do require a lot of cleaning. <laughs> Cleansing would be equivalent to dusting, vacuuming, picking up dirty t-shirts from the floor, opening a window to let stale air out. Just the little things that aren't a huge deal, but they do get tracked in. They do start to pile up over time. Tending to these things is just sort of basic maintenance. So that's cleansing. Now, when I talk about banishing, imagine this teenager also has a pile of dirty dishes on their desk. Now this is much, much worse than just like 
a t-shirt on the floor that's been worn once because after a while they are really going to start to stink. They will start to mold. They will attract flies and ants. If crumbs or any liquid juices, whatever spills from the bowl or the plate, then it starts spreading out. And then of course you're gonna get ants and flies and mold there as well. Those dishes are dirty on their own, just like the t-shirt. But unlike the t-shirt, they are going to be continuously making more dirtiness. So the equivalent of banishing would be taking those dishes and removing them from the room. Warding or shielding would be setting the rule for the teenager that they are no longer allowed to bring food or dishes into their room to begin with. You as the I guess the parent in this analogy are putting up the rule, you are putting up the barrier that those dishes can't even come in to begin with. Finally, there's exorcism, which we're not really going to cover today because it's sort of more advanced. Actually, it is more advanced banishing. Now, exorcism would be akin to black mold growing in the walls. And like I said, I'm not really going to cover it partly because it's rare, but also because it totally requires its own video. I also wanna say that cleansing and banishing are pretty similar, but they're not exactly the same. And oftentimes when we say protective magic in a general sense, we're usually talking about warding or shielding. And also today I'm mostly gonna use the term warding. So first of all, what would you need protection from? As I mentioned earlier, when we talk about protection, it can be from a broad number of things. The first one I wanna cover is negative energy because this is going to be the most common. It's also the easiest to deal with. And I do believe that it should be part of any practitioner's foundational practice in knowing how to cleanse it and how to ward it, ward against it. No matter how much you protect yourself and your space from negative energy, some will over time seep through the cracks. It likes to spread and stick and it can also be self-replicating. You can pick up negative energy by visiting places where something traumatic or negative has occurred. You can pick it up from other people. You can also create it yourself. That's the tricky part. This is very commonly done with, you know, negative thought patterns, but you could have the most protected, most well-warded home. You and your significant other get into a, a big argument in the living room. Well, now the living room is full of negative energy. At the end of the day, negative energy is a natural force of life. You're going to encounter it. And as I mentioned, at times you're going to create it. It's okay. That's why we cleanse and we ward. It's not something to be afraid of, but it is something to be cautious of. It can make you feel tired, anxious, ill at ease. It can make you feel generally down or in a bad mood. It can also make you very irritable and hypercritical of yourself and others. Like I mentioned, it can replicate itself. So imagine you've just encountered somebody who's in a bad mood. They're not even trying to hide it. They just have frustration and anger or sadness just coming off of them in waves. Now, for a lot of us, that is immediately going to feel very intense and very heavy. And so we will try to extricate ourselves from that situation and kind of get away from that person as quickly as possible. But sometimes it just takes an instant and the damage is done. Now, suddenly you're also in a bad mood because their negative energy spread to you. They don't even have to necessarily be mean to you or take their frustration out on you for it to get past. Now imagine you go to the coffee shop and normally you're very lighthearted and chatty with your barista, but now you're kind of closed down. They're going to pick up on that. They're going to sense that, you know, maybe every little thing, the, the long wait in line, the long wait for your drink is just making you more and more irritated and frustrated. Everybody around you is going to pick up on that, whether they notice it or not. For some people, that's a little bit more of a subconscious sense. And now you've just spread that to the barista and everybody around you who is coming into contact with your negative energy. So as you can see, like I mentioned, it replicates and it's very, very common. 
Next up is entities. Often, unless you are actively summoning spirits or entities or trying to communicate with them, you don't really have to worry about this one. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll never encounter one because you can always move into a space that already has one inhabiting it, or you can purchase an item that kind of has like a hitchhiker on it. There are also people who can summon spirits in order to send them to other people, but as we'll cover in the curse section, this is very, very rare. But again, don't freak out. Unless you are actively summoning, you normally don't have to worry about this. If you do practice spirit communication or you are interested in practicing communication or summoning, I highly recommend that you check out my video on spirit communication where I talk about this a little bit more and I do discuss some techniques for warding. While I'm talking about other videos I've already done, if you do feel that you have an entity in your home, whether it's something you summoned, something sent to you, or a hitchhiker on an item that you purchased, I do have videos on a banishing ritual as well as one on completely cleansing and protecting in your house. Um, the latter is one that everybody should probably watch after this one if you haven't already. Both of those are linked down below in the description box. Next up is interference. When I say interference, this could be in day-to-day -day life, in the overall effects of your life. It could also be interference with your spell work, which is often in the form of opposing intentions. Protection and warding against interference is often done during spell work, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people cast circles prior to spell work. They are creating this spherical space where the work that they are actively doing is also being actively warded and protected from outside influences. But circle casting is one of those topics that will require its own video, so I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. However, when I say interference, I don't just mean interference within spell work and ritual, I also mean interference in your day-to-day -day life. So I will touch on that next as I cover ill intentions and curses. I saved this one for last because despite what a lot of people believe, this is probably the least common one for most people. I will be coming out with a video all about to figure out if you've been cursed. But right now, I want you to keep in mind that unless you know another practitioner and they don't like you, or you don't get along with them, or maybe you're doing something that affects them in a way that they don't like, and they are also completely comfortable with casting curses, because remember, not all practitioners are, then most people will never ever encounter a curse in their life. However, this does sort of overlap with interference. Now, how a curse would be interference, because there is overlap there, as I mentioned, is pretty obvious. But another way we see this overlap is that sometimes if someone has a strong enough intention, whether they are a magical practitioner or not, if they are constantly just thinking negative thoughts about you, hoping that bad things will happen to you, they could accidentally send those ill intentions your way unintentionally. Now this is still fairly uncommon because number one, hopefully you're already warding yourself against that sort of thing. And number two, it takes a lot of energy to be done unintentionally, especially by somebody who does not already practice magic. 999 times out of a thousand, even for magical practitioners, having an impulsive thought like, oh, I hate that guy. I want him to get hit by a bus is not going to result in him actually being hit by a bus. But if on a regular basis, somebody is wishing ill on you, they're thinking mean thoughts about you, not even necessarily thinking like, I hope they get hit by a bus, but you know, just thinking like they don't deserve that or they're stupid or whatever. These things can in very small amounts start to manifest. Now, typically this is going to be in the form of negative energy, we're coming full circle here. They're thinking negative thoughts and those negative thoughts are getting sent your way, but not in a specific way. So no, you're not going to get hit by a bus, but you will start to feel the effects of that negativity. So imagine, just imagine you have no defenses, right? If somebody purposefully, a magical practitioner purposefully curses you, that's like getting hit with a bullet. That's kind of melodramatic, but you get what I'm saying. Now, if somebody who is not a magical practitioner is just like, ugh, they're so annoying, ugh, I don't like them, ugh, I hope they 
don't get promoted or I hope they fail their quiz, whatever. Those are kind of like just little flicks. They're just flicking at you. Like it, it can hurt a little bit and it's definitely irritating, but it's not this full blown thing. So I don't want to freak anybody out by talking about this like accidental manifestation because it's not really anything to worry about, but it is something to keep an eye on just like I said about negative energy. So let's talk about types of protection. First, there's avoiding. This is probably the most obvious. If you're scared of inviting a dark entity in your house, then simply don't do it. Don't summon spirits, don't try to communicate with them. And of course, there's the obvious one of take a look at who you surround yourself with. Don't allow toxic people in your life. Now that one, I do stand by. If you have toxic people in your life as much as possible, kick them out. Whether you're worried about negative energy or not, it just get rid of them. However, I understand sometimes, what if it's a coworker, you know, or what if you want to communicate with spirits, but you are paranoid about inviting something dark in or something dark being attracted to what you're doing, you know, you you can still protect yourself in that right this is this is easier said than done the whole avoiding technique and it's also like the argument that you know celibacy is the best form of birth control well yeah of course it is but where's the fun in that so that's just number one because let's get it out of the way sure if you can avoid things that you may need protection from then by all means do so but you can still protect yourself without the use of avoidance. The second most obvious one is cleansing. Like I mentioned earlier, cleansing is a foundational practice. This is typically used for negative energy. It's also used if you've just done a banishing and you wanna kinda just sweep out the last bit of the dust. Also, if you've been working with a little bit of you know, darker, I hate that term for it, but darker magic, it's a good way to neutralize, reset, you know, just cleanse the area, especially because typically when you're working with that kind of magic, it you're usually using a lot of heightened negative emotions. Not always, but a lot of the time, you know, you're angry at somebody, you're upset, you're hurt, you're crying, whatever. So cleansing is good for your tools, your space, as well as yourself. And it's a really good idea to have a sort of routine of cleansing. You don't have to cleanse everything every day, but perhaps get yourself on a schedule. Maybe I like to do monthly for most things, because as I mentioned before, negative energy, no matter how much you've warded, can seep through the cracks. And of course you can create it yourself. As I already mentioned earlier, I did an entire video on cleansing and warding your house, link down below. I highly recommend you check it out. But cleansing in a general sense is another bit of this that will require its own video. So I just wanna keep this short and summarize a bit of information. Cleansing can be done with sunlight, smoke, sweeping, sound, water, salt, soil, washes like Florida water, and some other ways that I'm probably forgetting right now, smoke cleansing is probably the most popular. Partly because there are so many different types of items you can use, it is a fairly easy way to cleanse, and smoke can be used to cleanse anything from a huge spacious room to, you know, a tiny little crystal shard. A great alternative to this if you cannot burn things or if you or someone you live with cannot be around smoke is sound cleansing. I do have a whole video on that. When it comes to yourself, yes, smoke and sound cleansing will work, but some wonderful alternatives to those if you like to mix it up a bit is egg cleansing, which I do have a video for, as well as ritual cleansing baths. Next is energetic warding. This is the utilization of energy to create a protective shield, and it does require very strong visualization. However, you do not need physical items for this, which makes it a very useful practice to have in your back pocket for when you are just out about in the world or you're traveling or just anytime, anywhere. You simply raise energy and then guide it to where you need it to be. So for example, if you were raising energy to cast a circle, you would form the boundary of the circle and then shape it into a sphere. I think one of the most popular versions of this that a lot of us learn very early into witchcraft is the visualization of 
bright white protective light cascading down over our heads and completely covering and protecting us. Now that one's not really my style anymore, but it was a really useful one that I practiced regularly in order to ward myself, but also to build up that foundational skill of warding myself with energy. So if your shield or bubble or little protective cocoon or whatever isn't bright white light, that's okay, you're not doing anything wrong. Next is physical warding. This is another very, very broad one because physical protective items can be so many different things and they can do so many different things. So you have amulets, you have salt, crystals, red brick dust, certain plants, and so on and so forth because that list is long. These items are typically charged up with the intention of warding and you can either carry them on you pr to protect your person, you can put them in thresholds or around the perimeter of your space to protect your home, or of course you can use them to outline a physical line when you cast a circle. Candles, you would draw the circle in chalk, you would create it by sprinkling holy water. Depending on which items that you use, they typically either absorb negative energy to hold it back for you, sort of like a, a bulletproof vest, or they repel it, it bounces right off. Most of these items are typically going to be either replaced entirely or simply recharged on a semi-frequent basis. About once a month is when just part of basic maintenance, I do all of my cleansing and I also go around my home and I also take anything that I wear for protection, for warding, and I recharge them. This is just a part of my routine practice. Videos on making and using both black salt as well as red brick dust are linked down below in addition to a video on how to enchant jewelry. So if you have an item of jewelry that you want to charge specifically, with the intention of warding, check out that video. If you follow a specific tradition or a type of folk magic, I highly encourage you to look up different items and their protective purposes within that specific practice. Next is spirit. First of all, when I say spirit here, I am using that as a broad term, but asking spirit for protection can be done anywhere for any reason depending only on whether or not you work with spirit. So that could be deity, it could be ancestors, it could be guardian spirits, it could be land spirits, general helpful spirits that you have a relationship with, the elements, etc., etc., etc. If you have a relationship there, you can always call upon them and ask them for protection. Then there's ritual. Ritual protection can take a ton of different forms, but in a general sense, I do mean any spell or ritual done for protection, whether that is cleansing, warding, or banishing. It could be anything from the banishing spell that I did a video on to a cord cutting. Hex breaking, a ritual to summon a protective spirit, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, the star ruby, an exorcism. I would also even include things like a ritual cleansing bath to this category. But yes, if you are the type that you prefer elaborate ritual to do everything, then there's cleansing rituals, there's warding rituals, and there are banishing rituals. Sigils, symbols, and runes. Whether it is a sigil of protection that you made yourself, whether it is the helm of awe, or just a painting that you made of a symbol of something that represents protection to you. These can be used in many different forms for warding. I have personally designed my own sigils to ward my house. I like to dip my finger in moon water and draw them on my doors and windows. But you could wear a, a necklace with a pendant that has thurisas carved into it or keep a representation of Hecate outside of your children's rooms since she guards and protects children. This is really just way too much to sit here and list out because there's so much you could do with sigils, symbols, and runes. You can use any one of those that you like. You can draw them on your shoe. You can visualize them imprinted in your chest. You can carve them into things. You can paint them on things. It's, it's, uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that because there's literally an endless amount of suggestions there. And finally, there is immediate banishing. This is typically a just ready to go 
emergency stop button that you can use during summoning or communication. Say you're using a talking board and you sense the presence of something dark and it unsettles you, it scares you, and you want it gone immediately. You don't necessarily have to stop and do an entire elaborate ritual. I mean, if it's really bad, you probably should. But for the most part, if something kind of peeks its head in and you're like, no, 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 get out, 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 out. Like, it can be done. You can just do this immediate vanishing. So this immediate vanishing, which I'm going to refer to as an emergency stop. The emergency stop can take a lot of different forms. And of course it can depend on your practice, your tradition that you follow, or your own personal preference. Some people will mentally send out a blast of energy to send the thing away. And that blast may sometimes take a specific form when they visualize it, like a pentagram or a shield and a sword. Other people use words of power. And again, these are often words that are based on personal preference as well as your magic tradition. It's kind of like a safe word. One really good example is from Crowley's The Star Ruby, which starts off with Apo Pantos Cacodimonos, which debatably translates to away every evil spirit. That about sums it up. Once again, if there was something that I touched on that you would love me to do a deep dive video on, please let me know in the comments and I will happily do so. Now, my biggest word of advice is do not go overboard. <laughs> Examine what types of protection you need and then experiment with different techniques. Don't feel like, oh no, I, I'm in danger because I don't have, you know, salt in every doorway and, and, and cacti growing under every window and railroad spikes in every corner of my yard. And I need to smoke cleanse and then run it off with sound cleansing. Oh, and then I need to do a ritual bath. But, but now I feel like maybe I was putting negative energy into my space after I had cleansed the space because I hadn't cleansed myself first. Like just, just calm down. Like, first of all, if you never practice evocation, then you may not have any use for words of power. So that's one thing you don't need to worry about. If you often work with chaos magic, then a homemade sigil is probably going to serve you better than a rune. Basing it around the practices and the beliefs of your specific tradition can help you whittle it down a lot. That's why I mentioned that multiple times throughout the video. However, if you're an eclectic like me, it can take a little bit of experimenting, but really just follow your gut instinct and use the things that already work for you. If you work a lot in your garden, then yes, growing rose bushes on your premises is gonna do, you know, those thorns will do a lot to help ward and that might work better for you than say, you know, putting red brick dust on every single entryway of your house. Just don't feel like you have to do all of the things. Remember, paranoia can breed negative energy just as much as never cleansing breeds negative energy. Once again, a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Dossier. Make sure to check out their link down below in the description box. I genuinely hope this video has been helpful in guiding you down the path of magical protection. But again, I'm just scratching the surface. So I will do more videos on these topics, these various topics that I covered today. And of course, I encourage you to go out and do a bit of your own research as well. So stay safe. I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, stay magical.